So you won't take down lies or you will take down lies? And it's just a pretty simple yes or no. The ones making the accusations are his own employees at Amazon. Does Google track my movement? Everything that we do is an expression of human values. Bitcoin is digital and decentralized. It exists electronically. On all Ethereum layer twos, recently surpassed $10 billion. Stir on Twitter today, taking aim at Web3 and the metaverse and warning investors, it might not be all that it's cracked up to be. A war is raging against the tech giants to take back the control of data and privacy in our own hands. It's no doubt that crypto and blockchain went mainstream with the COVID pandemic. With the rise of thousands of cryptocurrencies, developers and investors are looking upon an opportunity to capitalize on current scenario. If you aren't living under the rock, you might have heard the term called Web3. Yeah, that Web3 which is claimed to be built on top of blockchain by using smart contracts spread in decentralized manner to protect your identity and keep you safe online. If you look closely to all of the content and material that's been put out on the internet, Web3 blisteringly sounds like a fairy tale. However, there are many critics like Jack Dorsey and Elon Musk who claims Web3 as BS. And I want to take you on a journey of truth. Things that very few people are talking about Web3 and how it could turn out to be the biggest Ponzi scheme that you are yet to encounter. Being a dev myself, I wanted to show you the underlying infrastructure that runs the current World Wide Web and Internet to really understand what's going on right now. Computers aren't a new thing for us. In fact, we have been evolving computers over a century. Computers were invented to do the calculation faster and make human life easier. As you know, prior to 1980, computers didn't have any networking capability, making it just a giant number crunching machine which were only useful to businesses, universities and military. But the invention of ARPANET changed the feet of what computers can do. US defenses started to lay down long stretch of cables across the country connecting various cities in the west coast. Starting from 1969 till late 80s, the network expanded to all major cities. In order to use this network effectively, we need a set of instructions to communicate properly with other computers in network. Enter the TCP IP or Transmission Control Protocol that is Internet Protocol that is being used right now. The HTTP or HTTPS is the implementation of TCP IP. For the scope of this story, I'm not going to talk about how it works, but you can watch this video by Linus on TechWiki. While entering in the 90s, this network was no longer limited to universities and organization. Various ISPs started to emerge to give people access to that network. Talking about India where I live, in 1969, government sanctioned a project called ERNet or Educational Research Network that connected these five IITs like Delhi, Mumbai, Kanpur, Kharagpur and Chennai. However, VSNL first launched the internet to the public in 15th August 1995, which provided 9.6 kilobits per second, staggeringly 5,000 rupees, which is ridiculously expensive for those times. And that also really makes me laugh because my ISP provides me 200 Mbps connection for just 1,000 rupees a month, which is a fraction of that price, what it was in 1995, and which is 20,000 times faster than what it was back then itself. Which just goes to show how far have we came right here. Again, let's come back to the 90s in US. As the tree of internet started to become more and more complex, sending files or data from one place to another became more complicated since you need to manually enter those route towards your destination. And all of this problem came to an end when we devised the centralized approach of using the DNS. That way, you just have to enter the destination and all of the routing stuff was done automatically. One of the key trends to notice is the Moore's law. As the number of transistors doubled every two years, the cost of computing keep decreasing. PC became every household item. That in itself created a new ecosystem. With the rise of new ecosystem, it essentially creates an opportunity for new economics. With an invention of World Wide Web, Accessing content became much more easier for general public. Netscape entered as the first major browser in the market which allowed people to access all sites at that time. Soon the number of websites increased exponentially and noticeable amongst them were Yahoo, Google, Amazon, Apple, etc. But even in late 90s, internet wasn't a global phenomena as there were not many submarine cables laid out that connected every continent to have abundant bandwidth. The first transatlantic continental cable was laid out in 1858 connecting US and Europe. 
what you are essentially looking at right now is the current network of oceanic cables that is spread across the globe. As you can see, there are many of them. The vast network of these cables are the reason why we are able to stream and download large files quickly. The interesting thing is that more than half of these cables were laid in last 20 years. This is the reason why today's internet is way more sophisticated. Now with regards to Web3, oftentimes you will see many people describing the difference between Web1 being read-only and Web2 having an element of interactivity or period of user-generated content where people could share their content on MySpace or Facebook. However, in reality, Web1 and Web2 are exactly the same thing. What we did was to introduce JavaScript and stacked a layer of protocols on top of each other and just expanded its potential. The rest, the backend server remained the same. After the dot-com bust, very few companies survived and those who stood alive went on to dominate the market for decades to come. But even in mid-90s, a lot of the site owner had one question in mind. How will they earn money? I mean, no one does anything for free, so they had a dilemma that from whom they should charge money from. Now, even in those times, advertisement wasn't a new phenomena. The first ad date back to 1704 in Boston Newsletter. Even in early stage, advertisers were eager to get on the bandwagon of internet. How about sending your mom some nice flowers? All you do is click on Marketplace, we place an order. Call now for America Online, a new way to use your computer to communicate. Soon, many companies realized that it's a win-win strategy for everyone. As a customer, I get to enjoy the service for free. As a customer, that they can market their product. And as a company, I can generate profit. This is the trend which continues to work even today. I'm sure you have heard this quote. If you don't pay for the product, you are the product. This is the reason why every innovation by this tech company till today was revolved around advertisement. Be it cookies, data broking, collecting tons of user data, third-party tracking, making apps addictive for users. The best example of that I can see is TikTok and Instagram Reels. Part of what really enabled this company to develop such analytics with pinpoint accuracy was enhancement in artificial intelligence or machine learning. Again, by no means AI is a new thing. You can get hands-on to some of the research paper that date back to 60s or even before. But it was until 2000 when the GPU performance started to rise exponentially and it made opportunity for developers and researchers to test their theory in reality. And over time, we got amazing innovations in pattern recognition, deep fakes, and noticeably the OG GPT-3. And when you give all the power in hands of few companies, you get something like... Amazon, the world's biggest online retailer, is bracing for protest. Amazon employees and activists in 20 countries have launched a campaign. They're calling it Make Amazon Pay. Amazon is harming fair competition here in Europe. That is what the European Commission said today when it filed antitrust charges against Amazon. It's another major setback for Facebook, the social media giant already under fire for not protecting users' private information, now admitting it's been hacked again. So people are angry. And they want the control in their own hands. Wait, why does it sound so familiar? Like, which is the place where people were fed up of monarchy, had witnessed massive famines, also have seen like major ideological reformations and has the largest land area. Oh, it's Russian communism. But <laughs> I mean, <laughs> jokes apart. Seriously, whenever humanity has ever experimented with communism, it has drastically failed. It's just because of how human nature works. And Web3 is that manifestation of communism. To really understand why I'm saying this, we need to see how developers and company choose where they deploy their code so that everyone gets to use it. Now, I can host a website on this computer, but I or anyone will not do it simply because my laptop could serve barely a couple of hundred requests at a time and my internet connection might not be reliable. Plus, there's a lot of electricity issues at my home. So anyone will generally use any hosting provider or cloud services like AWS, Azure, GCP as they have dramatic ability to scale from one user to one million users at no time. Patty McCord, an ex-chief talent officer at Netflix, mentions in her book Powerful that when Netflix decided to enter into the streaming business while transitioning from DVD business, they figured out that they would consume one third the internet bandwidth of US. If they had to create their own data center, it would have taken them many years. Instead, they hired a bunch of cloud professionals and went with AWS. And guess what? They just did it in nine months, which is astounding. Consider how big Netflix was even at that time. 
Good thing about this cloud provider is that they have data centers in all continents except for Antarctica because we don't need there. This is the entire map of AWS, Azure and GCP combined. Everyone knows that monolithic architecture or in simple terms having one or fewer servers running your entire application in one place isn't very good idea since machines tend to fail all the time. And during peak hour if your machine goes down then that's not a very pleasant scenario. And that is why microservices started to emerge after mid 2000s. That was the beginning of adoption of distributed system. You have also heard that blockchain is decentralized. That is no one really owns it and it's spread across the globe. But that is also the case with distributed system as we have saw in case of cloud provider. So what is the difference between both of them? Decentralized is essentially a distributed system with open participation, meaning Anyone can hook up their machine to it and can be the part of it. Example being torrent and Bitcoin mining software. We know that Amazon, Google, Facebook are centralized entity that collects all the data in their own servers. But what happens if they make software that uses your computer's CPU power to process all the requests that they get? In exchange of that, they will pay you some money for doing the work. In this scenario, will this system remain centralized or decentralized? I will leave this up to you. A lot of tutorial and articles I have seen on Web3 really is superficial by nature. I mean, they just talk about building APIs, which is indeed abstract by its nature. No one seemed to talk about the tech stack or the machine in which the code are gonna run. Here's the thing. In ideal world, a truly decentralized system would mean that everyone would have equal computing power and effective protocols that cater to it. But you know, we aren't living in ideal world. If you want to enter in the server racking business, then you need to do it on a scale that's identical to these cloud providers to really make a good money out of it. That is, you will need to have pool of thousands of servers in a single data center. This isn't something I'm speaking out of thin air, but it's actually happening in Bitcoin mining community. Sure, in 2013, if you were to mine Bitcoin on a laptop, then you could get a decent compensation for it. But now, crypto mining space is ruled by few mining oligarchies, which scalps all the GPU in their own data centers, which doesn't sound like a true symbol of equality. All you need to ask whether a system is decentralized or centralized is where my code is being deployed. And we saw that there is no truly decentralized system. In a blockchain, if you want true immutability, there is no better option than proof of work, but that's really sluggish. The debate between proof of work and proof of stake is still a hot topic in crypto world. As the proof of stake is kind of centralized approach that defeats the purpose of Web3. Even if you look at the layer 2 solutions of Polygon Matic, even they are running on centralized approach. By taking a rapid snapshot of all the transactions and writing them slowly over Ethereum network, thus acting like a middleman, which is what we are trying to get rid of in so-called Web3. Okay, just for clarity purpose, for those people who don't really understand what Polygon Matic is, it's basically a system which sits on top of Ethereum blockchain. Now, just like Bitcoin has its own mining pool, mining system and mining network, Ethereum does have its own mining networks and mining system. The problem with Ethereum is that the transaction rates are very slow. I mean, it's just 15 transactions per second and the gas fees are as high as like a couple of hundred dollars or something like that. So Polygon Matic really sits on top of this Ethereum blockchain and it, and it has like dramatically higher throughput of 65,000 transactions per second. So it really processes all the transaction, it really saves all the tables, all the records and slowly over the period of time, it dumps all of the record into the Ethereum blockchain network itself. Let's talk about these exchanges like Coinbase, Binance and Bitfinex, which is infamous for its 2016 hack. All of these exchanges are centralized by nature, which was never the objective of Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrency. And interestingly, Bitcoin is the favorite thing for FBI to trace the criminals. Here's you might say that why not build a decentralized exchange? Well, the problem for that is centralized approach are fantastic for building financial apps as they can't tolerate a delay of split second and replicating this property in so-called DeFi or decentralized finance is really, really hard problem. And almost every government is mandating this exchange to do the KYC of end users so that your activity can be traced for income tax purpose and possibly to spot any illegal activity. This begs the question that if crypto and Web3 were meant to be anonymous, so what is this? Another example I would like to showcase is about MetaMask. Whenever you open a new account with MetaMask wallet, 
it says you have to remember this passphrase without it you can't access this wallet and you know we humans are terrible at remembering the things so i might use a password manager which is again a centralized system and there are already phishing scams that are happening around crypto wallets like metamask this becomes particularly important because thousands of people are investing in this nfts web3 and crypto projects without knowing how all these things works and let's suppose even if this web3 things took off and become successful then what how will be the business model of these things is it paid subscription is it advertisement or is it anything else so ultimately we are landing on the same problem that we are really experiencing right now and probably these applications will be developed by a developers and the company which has its own mutual interest so that is kind of free really like you know a double edged sword just like how what facebook is doing with us and ultimately that is the reason why i think it could turn out to be the biggest ponzi scheme ever now honestly web3 and the web3 community are its really nascent stages so it will be fun to see how they could really how they would really able to pull that off together it's just a practical scenario and no one has a clear definition of what web3 really actually is so with that said i hope you have liked this video consider subscribing for more updates i'm going to release the part 3 of this video make sure you check them out in the description as well uh with that said if you have any question comments or suggestion please leave down in the comment box below i'll be happy to get back to you till then stay connected and i'll see you next time